Hello? Hello? Hey, I know it's ironic I'm in a bathroom already, but I really need to pee, so like... Can you just put some slack on the chain or something? At least enough so I can reach a toilet? Oh! Hey, this is uh, this is great and everything, but I said I needed to pee, not that I needed a TV. Ah! Hello. Hi. Hello. Um. Uh, hi. Hello. Yes, hello! I'd like to play a game. Can I go to the bathroom first? In front of you is a vat of boiling oil and breadcrumbs. What? I have, I have taken your pants. Wait, no, no you didn't. In order to survive this game, you have to dip, dip your balls in the, in the breadcrumbs and then pour them in the boiling oil. Uh... <laughs> Just eating breadcrumbs while you watch. <laughs> Almost four years ago, I made a video talking about the McKamey Manor. What's up, YouTube? I'm participating in the Bury It Alive Challenge. <laughs> Honestly, what do know? Guys, 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 you know what? I don't blame the organization. I blame the people who signed up for this because that's just natural selection. <laughs> for those of you who don't remember, the McKamey Manor was a backyard haunted house run by Russ McKamey. This is Russ. Right here at McKamey Manor. Just want to give a quick introduction to the next little video you're going to see. This is Big Jeff. Now, Jeff went through our tour a couple of years ago in 2012, and he loved it, man. And he did really good, actually. It's so much different, though, this year that I don't think he was really prepared for it. And as you're going to see, it didn't last very long. The tour was over pretty quick. A retired Navy SEAL who put on full-fledged haunted attractions even back in the Navy days, creating makeshift haunted houses for his fellow service members. Over time, the attraction he is most well-known for, McKamey Manor, would go from being a monthly spectacle in California to it being a weekend haunt in Tennessee and, allegedly, Alabama, plagued with tax debt fraud, questionable legalities in the participation paperwork, and several victims coming forward being beaten to a pulp. The McKamey Manor was covered in mass on YouTube with several large content creators trying to overturn the rocks, hiding the mysteries of this infamous torture house. In that old video, which is outdated now, I refer to the McKamey Manor as a real-life Saw attraction, which is a cheeky title, I know. But even looking back on it, I don't even think that's an entirely fair assessment to make. I mean, at least people running through McKamey Manor survive. John Kramer could never. <laughs> My merch. Yes, everyone, the time has finally come. I have officially sold out. Has this ever happened to you? Yes, <laughs> well, in order to prevent whatever that was, you can buy a t-shirt with my stupid face on it. Now, I'm sure you're probably asking yourself, hey, how is this supposed to help me prevent whatever the hell that was? Uh, it won't, <laughs> but you get a cool t-shirt. So that's cool. Stop looking like a loser and wear my face on your body. Also, uh, there's a, a discount code for 15% off your entire order up until October 21st. So uh, that ends literally next week. Sorry. <laughs> Buy it right now. Links in the description. Oh yeah, and support me on all the other things too. Back to the video, bye. It's Halloween, and technically I've been celebrating this holiday all the time because after October, I live the rest of the year in denial. But considering I've been on a horror movie binge lately and Saw X just came out this year, I'd figured that I'd actually experience this franchise for myself. I mean, I've been watching fans of the series and their videos for quite a while, so I already knew so much about the franchise, 
without actually watching the movies. But here's the thing. If you had watched me for long enough, you would know that a big ick I have, a visceral sense of evasion for me when it comes to media would be anything gory. I'm not a big fan of gore by itself. What I mean by that is I'm not a huge fan of gore with no presentation or meaning behind it. At least for something like Mortal Kombat or Junji Ito's horror novels, which I'm in love with, there is some personality and sense of fantasy behind the goriness of these mediums. Junji Ito is a master of the art of body horror, the shock of most of his stories and what he can do to the human body that shouldn't even be physically possible. Mortal Kombat's gore has a fantasy element to it. It became this huge middle finger to the rating system of video games. I mean, hell, it's the reason why the ESRB was created in the first place. And it's a big part of the personality of the franchise. But gore just by itself for the sake of it and watching other people suffer, I... I don't know, I just can't get behind it. I'm not a fan of watching gore and people dying in brutal ways just for the hell of it. I'd like there to be at least some meaning to it or some reason for it to be there. Not just for the sake of shocking the audience. And a big reason as to why I steered clear from Saw was because I always thought that that's what it was. I mean, can you blame me for thinking that? The series has been bombarded and dismissed by critics as a torture porn series. Nothing more than just watching people dying in elaborate death traps. And since the ratings over the years of these films have significantly decreased, and even the fans of the franchise had been making fun of the later movies, I didn't really see a reason to engage in these films. The sequels seemed like cash grab garbage to what was considered an iconic horror film. And the series as a whole has been basically boiled down to just imitating a snuff film essentially. But then I decided to actually sit down and watch all of them and... Well, okay, don't get me wrong. The movies are dumb. The sequels especially are cash grab garbage. And yes, over time watching the traps, they just eventually become an elaborate way of watching people die violently. But also, no, although the criticisms of the Saw films are valid in some aspects, I think that there's still a conversation to be had still about how this series has evolved and why people like Saw and how it has become this horror icon in the same vein as Chucky or Freddy Krueger. And also, if this series is nothing more than just a torture porn fest with no substance, like the critics claim it is, then how come it's one of the most popular horror franchises even after 20 years has passed? I mean, people to this day, despite the two decades that have passed, and the many sequels that stood no chance in outperforming the original movie, even in some cases ruined the legacy of the first. Regardless, there are still old and even new fans of the franchise. But... Why? In this video, I intend not only to give a full review and rundown of the Saw franchise, but also explain how a dismissed horror icon still manages to find footing in Hollywood all of these years later. So without further ado, this is Saw. Saw is a psychological horror film directed by James Wan and written by Leigh Whannell. So before we get into like what happens in the first Saw movie, I want to kind of talk about James and Leigh for just a moment because this duo is truly a rags to riches story. There's a documentary that I'll be referring to a lot throughout this section of the video, and you can watch it on YouTube. It's called Game Changer, The Legacy of Saw. I highly recommend you check out this documentary. I think it's really cool. So James and Leigh were both film school graduates from RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Born from a Chinese-Malaysian background, Juan met Winnell in film school and both found a fountainess in the horror genre. Whilst completing their schooling and working towards their bachelor's degrees, the two struck up a similar idea for a different type of horror movie. What James and Leigh would go on to do is make a mock-up or a short film to actually pitch to studios to get more money to expand on their idea into a full feature-length movie. Saw.5, as it's referred to by the fanbase, was a 10-minute short film that was first picked up by a friend of James, which was then pitched to Lionsgate. The two newly graduated directors were given only $1.2 million and less than 20 days to film on location, which didn't 
it seem like a lot, especially like in comparison to how films are made nowadays. What they lacked in budget and time, they made up for in their cast. The cast that they had for this film was exceptional for a debut film, such as Carrie Elwes from The Princess Bride, Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon, no, not the, the one from Community. <laughs> always amazing and humble Tobin Bell, who plays the titular villain Jigsaw, aka John Kramer. Interestingly enough, in the first movie, John doesn't actually play a major influence as he does in the following sequels. In fact, John, for the first week of filming the movie, would lay on the floor in fake blood instead of opting for a body double or body prop. Tobin was laying there the entire time. And God bless him, man. That's no easy task to be laying on the floor every day. To be able to go up to one of these great character actors and go, hey man, we need you to lie on the floor for the entire shoot. And we're gonna cover you up in blood. And, uh, and if you don't mind, when we move the cameras around, we're gonna be stepping on you every now and then. I hope that's cool with you. First day, it took about an hour and a half. Second day, it took about 45, because we knew what we wanted. James had passed on the thing. <laughs> and then the third day, it took about, I don't know, 20 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> Tobit Bell has a lot of dedication to the Saw films and is the main man carrying the weight of the series on his shoulders. And since his performance is so compelling that even after his character dies, they still have to find ways to shoehorn John into the series through flashbacks. But I, I'm not even complaining at this point because I love Tobin Bell. <laughs> because of the lack of time and budget, not only was Saw turned out quickly in production, but also a lot was cut from the project which might explain why a lot of characters who become major antagonists don't get a ton of screen time to develop their character and role in the story. And the film was made so quickly that not a whole lot of cuts were shot. A lot of the film consisted of first takes. This movie not only gave Leigh Whannell a chance to flex his writing skills for the movie, but also his acting. Both of which are questionable in this movie. What's your name? My name is very fucking confused. What's your name? I went to bed in my shithole apartment and woke up in an actual shithole. This is what they do, man. They kidnap you and drug you. Before you know it, you're lying in a bathtub and your kidneys are on eBay. Given the lack of everything that they were given, considering that they made a hundred million dollars back at the box office, for two graduates fresh out of college, what they would create is not only iconic now, but it's also like extremely impressive. The movie revolves around two men who wake up chained in a decrepit bathroom with a dead body between them and a cassette player, the former of which wakes up underwater for some reason and doesn't drown. Also, uh, the keys are left in the tub with him and they go down the drain when he wakes up, so he's basically fucked at this point. This is Adam, and he's trapped with Dr. Lawrence Gordon, a doctor caught up in his work and his affair, who doesn't spend time with his wife, Allison, and their daughter, Diana. As the movie unfolds, it's revealed that they are both victims of the sadistic serial killer known as Jigsaw, who sets up all these elaborate traps to test people's will to live. The story alternates between the events inside the bathroom and flashbacks that provide insight into Jigsaw's motivations and the backstory of the victims. During one of these flashbacks, Dr. Gordon reveals that he was an actual suspect of the Jigsaw investigation led by Detective David Tapp and his partner, Detective Steven Singh. We also get to see other traps that have become well established within this franchise, such as the razor wire trap, the flammable jelly trap, and of course, the most well-known and most iconic trap, the reverse bear trap. The behind the scenes of which are actually really interesting as well because the traps can actually open and close. It's this aluminum headset that uses hydraulic pressure to snap it open. In fact, a lot of the traps that are made for the Jigsaw movies that involve some sort of mechanism are actually designed to work. 
Now, obviously, when I say that, <laughs> I don't mean that these traps could actually kill you, but they are designed to either open or spin or do some sort of mechanical thing safely to give a sense of realism to these mechanisms that John has made to test people. Speaking of testing people, a lot of what makes the Saw movies so different from other horror movies is the fact that Jigsaw has this moral code of sorts. I feel like over time with the traps getting more and more over the top, the morality being more and more blurred with each sequel and has all but vanished from the series at this point, a lot of people don't really know what the point of Jigsaw's murders are anymore. I mean, that's understandable. Like, if you have seen the entire series at this point, then you know that at least with the first three movies, Jigsaw has this sort of method to the madness. His traps are meant to be escapable in one way or another. The victim is given ample opportunity and time to figure out how to get out of the traps. Now, surviving said traps means that you have proven to have a survival instinct and a new appreciation for life. John tests people because they lack an appreciation for their own life or lives of other people, and by fighting for their lives and making drastic decisions to save themselves, it makes them appreciate their lives and not take it for granted. At every single crime scene of every failed test, Jigsaw takes a piece from all of his victims, and this missing piece is symbolic of the survival instinct that they lack. Now, later in this review, I will go over each of the movies to test this morale because if you're an avid Saw fan, you know that this philosophy doesn't hold up in the later films, like, at all. But personally, I would even argue that even in the first Saw movie, this philosophy is utter bullshit. I'll explain why later, but just know that John Kramer isn't really as smart as people actually say he is. Okay, so since I just spoiled the whole series for you guys, why don't I actually talk about the first one finally, since that's what this part of the video is about. The first Saw movie is good. As stupid as some of the dialogue is and how silly the murder mystery is with this hooded man with an Assassin's Creed hidden blade and Joker contraptions. Dude, I swear to God, this is a comic book Batman villain. But you have to remember this was made on a shoestring budget. A small loan of a million dollars, if you will. But regardless of that, I think for a horror movie icon, I can see why this got so popular. It has this grunge house vibe with quick, fast edits and arc shots. This really saturated blood that looks like paint and whatever the fuck this line was. I'm having a blast. This is the most fun I've had without lubricant. Our daddy taught us not to be ashamed of our dicks. But I think as a mystery and a suspenseful thriller, this movie hits different. Like, oddly enough, I can actually handle watching the other movies, even though they're more gory and violent. But something about Dr. Gordon getting so desperate that he cuts off his own foot and it's implied off screen is so... It's weirdly stomach turning, even though you don't see anything. It's just so... Ugh. It's the implied violence of the horror that gets to me more than any of the other movies. The fact that we don't really see anyone directly die in death traps and it's all kind of implied or done in flashbacks or we see the aftermath is more horrifying than any on-screen death in a saw trap. And then there's the plot twist, which... I'm gonna be honest here. In retrospect, it's not really that good of a twist. Now hold on. Hold on. Wait. 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 Let me explain. I think what kills this twist more than anything is the film over-explaining itself. It cuts back to seemingly random dialogue that makes the storytellers go, Hey, uh, remember when they said that that thing, this seemingly random line of dialogue that you didn't pay attention to? Well, it's actually really, really important. <laughs> if the movie didn't edit itself like this, maybe the audience would have relied on past dialogue as context clues instead of the film just spelling it out for you. I feel like if they emphasize more on John Kramer as an established connection to all of these characters, then it would make a little more sense. But instead, you see this dead guy rise up and they're thinking to yourself, hold on, wasn't that the dude who was like taking a nap in the hospital for that one scene? The the dude that was literally in a coma? Was that was I supposed to give a shit about him? I, I... 
I thought he was a cancer patient. Other than that, I think Saw is such a fascinating little film. The way that they pitched this movie with a short film, then expanded upon it the way they did, it's just something else. These people really did have a passion for this, and I don't think it's fair to dismiss this first one just because the rest of the films are kind of garbage, and just turn the rest of the series into a shock fest. This first movie is still very well done, and considering how popular escape rooms are now, this movie is actually really ahead of its time. And I think as a suspenseful thriller, it's really great. And then you get to Saw 2. So exactly one year since the first movie, Saw 2 came out starring Donnie Wahlberg, who is in stuff, I think. Also, apparently Donnie is related to Mark Wahlberg. You know, the guy who uh, beat a Vietnamese man with his own cane. And I guess he's, he's in other things like... The Happening. What? No. Also, Donnie was charged with a first degree arson, so... Authorities stated that Wahlberg, then known as the bad boy of the boy band New Kids on the Block? Fucking hot. I mean, in comparison to his brother nearly beating a man to death, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay, so the first movie sort of established a few styles going forward that'll make up a typical Saw film. It wasn't super established with the first movie, but it later became a staple of the second and beyond that. All the movies start with some sort of jigsaw trap. Even the spin-offs do this, and I will get to you Let's later. To Every Saw movie has to have a new twist ending which over time gets progressively more and more fucking stupid. So the first trap of the second film is the Venus fly trap. Now, I could do what millions of other like film brains do and talk about how painfully easy it would be to escape these traps if you just kind of like think about it for more than five seconds, but I'm just gonna sum it up like this. At this point in the movies, the Jigsaw games only work and Jigsaw's plans always go perfectly because Jigsaw is reliant on everyone in these movies being fucking brain dead. <laughs> So Donnie Wahlberg is a cop who has a son who doesn't like living with him, mainly because he's a cop and cares more about his job than his own family. But honestly, I think his kids should cut him a little more slack, considering that he is currently investigating and being mocked by the Jigsaw Killer. So I don't know, like, maybe there's a reason he doesn't pay attention to you, Daniel. Anyway, so Donnie Wahlberg corners Jigsaw at some location, but uh-oh, Jigsaw wants to play a game again. <laughs> this time he's testing a group of people, including Amanda Young, again. You know, that girl from the reverse bear trap? She's being tested again. Why is she here again? Does Jigsaw require multiple therapy sessions for his philosophy to work? Gee, it's almost as if, even if you live through a Jigsaw trap, he never truly leaves you alone. You know, it's almost like he's a psychopath. <laughs> so, this really is an escape room movie, as Jigsaw gives them instructions that they are all dying from the Tokyo Sarin attacks of 1995. Right now, you are breathing in the deadly nerve agent been breathing it since you arrived here. Those of you familiar with the Tokyo subway attacks will know its devastating effects on the human body. Man, maybe Jigsaw really is a cult leader. <laughs> now listen, I know a lot of people regard this as like a good sequel to the first Saw, and a lot of people actually really like this movie. I personally think it's kind of a hunk of garbage, but it's a hunk of garbage that I still sort of like because it has, you know, good moments in it like Tobin Bell. And that's it. When I say that Jigsaw and this movie are really reliant on the rest of the people in the movie being lobotomized, I mean it. Because there are so many things that could have gone wrong because of simple fucking things that Jigsaw didn't take into account or think ahead about that should have been resolved like immediately if anyone here knew how the fuck to do their job. First of all, the big plot twist of this movie is that the test of this film is actually not happening live. It actually happened a while ago, and Daniel, who was in the Saw Trap, is in a safe place. I <laughs> get it. Okay, so first of all, these officers should have figured out that this feed isn't happening live. Pretty much from the jump. While yes, it is being played out like a YouTube video premiere in another location, there should have been some ways that these hacker feed guys should have figured that out. If they were any good at their jobs. Also, I I'm not even kidding. 
These characters are some of the dumbest people on the planet. All they have to do to survive is literally just listen to what Jigsaw says. The difference between Jigsaw and the other movies is that he's not putting people into the traps, but the people themselves are putting themselves in the trap. And that's what makes this whole movie even more infuriating because literally all they have to do is listen to Jigsaw. I mean, sure, he still talks in this like cryptic way to solve a puzzle, but like some of this shit is so easily doable that I am shocked that any of them didn't figure it out after the first guy blows his eye out for literally not even listening to Jigsaw at all. Donnie by far is probably the dumbest character in this entire series because he didn't even have to do anything. He just had to sit there and listen to Jigsaw. And I mean, he's surrounded by police. It's not like he can hurt him or trick him into a trap or anything. I mean, he's practically confessing everything to Donnie Wahlberg. And for what? Ever reason, this detective, the lead detective, who has been investigating the Jigsaw killers for months at this point, this case is probably one of their biggest in their department. He is literally face to face with Jigsaw, who is confessing to everything, and Donnie Wahlberg couldn't give a shit. <laughs> I mean, look, I get it, he's worried about his son, but if Jigsaw is ensuring his safety and all of his confessions are truthful thus far, including everything with the traps, then why the hell wouldn't you listen to Jigsaw? I mean, even if he's lying to you, he's the only one who knows where your kid is, so it's just better to listen to his dog shit lies until you can get him to tell the truth. Anyways, so Amanda turns out to be like an accomplice to Jigsaw and has been helping Jigsaw out since the bathroom game from Saw 1. This is the only twist in the series that I actually kinda like. Amanda was given emphasis as a character in the first movie. They were the only survivor of Jigsaw's game in that movie. Her trap is the most iconic, and even in her first interview with the police, she says that she's actually grateful for Jigsaw. The film is basically building up this character to be the only successful Jigsaw victim. That, and she's in another trap again, even though she appreciated John's lesson. I mean, it, it all makes sense. Too bad they ruin her in the next movie. We're not really into, um, you know, gizzards spilling out of, uh, you know, s somebody's stomach or, or, you know, heads get being cut off. That's Despite the fun. sequels of Saw. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, I'm not really sure how this happened, but I lost all of the footage for my Saw 3 and 4 review. We're gonna just pretend that I didn't. So you watch Saw 3 and... I ask a question, why do you think gay people love horror so much? Because we do. Oh, I, I know why. I know why. Because we love seeing straight people get killed. Another year goes by exactly and Saw 3 comes out. This movie is where Jigsaw's games and philosophy really takes a shit on the floor. The new lesson to be learned by Jigsaw's traps in this round is learning forgiveness. Hey, I thought you were all about people being ungrateful for their lives. Are you teaching forgiveness because you're gonna die in this movie? Then what was the rest of your traps for after your death? Should I forgive you for those even though you're dead and still conducting games to kill people? Okay, whatever. So Donnie Wahlberg is stuck in the bathroom trap from the first movie and decides to break his foot instead of cut it off to escape. But I guess he doesn't because he decides to try to take down Amanda and arrest her despite him not standing a fucking chance. Why did you do that? We then cut to the first game of the movie, which is totally rigged against this guy, by the way. I mean, theoretically, there was a way he could have probably lived, but this chain is around his jaw and the door is welded shut. So there isn't a fucking chance. Okay, so the police are all like, well, John's a crazy psycho killer, but at least he's fair and he makes traps that people can at least survive. And to that, I say, yeah, right. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Even if these people survive his traps, they're still going to bleed to death and learn nothing. Also, if any of the traps of this movie are anything to go off of, I don't think John wants these people to escape on their own. So Psychology Cop is kidnapped and is put in a saw trap that is rigged because even though she did what she was supposed to, she dies anyways. This is when we learn that Amanda has been conducting and rigging the game so that people can't win. So here's why this pisses me off. Amanda was so grateful for John and his methods, and she was even down to fuck John Kramer, and you see that all throughout this movie. So why the fuck would she rig the traps if she believes John's methods actually work? She would want people to appreciate their lives as much as she does, so like, 
why wouldn't she just do as Jigsaw says? And also, what reason does she have for murder anyways? I get why she wants to kill the cops involved trying to catch him, but like, what the fuck did this guy do to her? So we're introduced to Dr. Lynn Denlin, who is kidnapped by Amanda to perform surgery on Jigsaw. If Jigsaw dies, she dies. Except he knows he's terminal already and can literally die at any time and they literally have no proper equipment, but you know, a Jigsaw really likes giving everyone a chance. So then we are introduced to Jeff. Jeff is sad because his son died to a drunk driver. John doesn't think that he's appreciating his life very much, so he puts him in a gauntlet run to save all of the people who contributed to his son's death. So do, do you see what the problem here is already? <laughs> Every victim that was put in a saw trap before this movie either had to work as a team to get out, work against each other to get out, or be left on their own and given a set amount of time to get out. Either way, they're all given a chance to escape for themselves. This movie makes it so that the people's lives are determined on whether or not this guy decides to let them live. How the fuck is that fair? How do these people fight to appreciate their lives more if this guy is the one that has to save them? Like, at this point, I'm pretty sure that Jigsaw wants these people to die. Let's be honest. You want him to suffer just as much as I do. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, and even though Jeff does manage to save the judge who let his son's killer go early or something, he still manages to die because Jeff was smart enough to not take a bullet for himself, but not smart enough to tell the judge to move the fuck out of the way. <laughs> the twist is, is that this whole sequence of events was actually Amanda's game and not Jeff's? But, like, she's already part of a game because Jigsaw told her he wanted to, directly to her face, play a game. And Jigsaw is already mad at her for rigging the trap, so, like, she's gotta know that she's gonna eat shit eventually. So Amanda dies because she's hot-headed, and Jeff is so mad at John for kidnapping him and putting him through all of this that he cuts John's throat in the most, um, underwhelming way you could cut a throat. <laughs> And then his wife dies because she's still wearing the shotgun collar, and because his heart rate is connected to the guns, it triggers and she dies. So no one, once again, learned a goddamn thing. <laughs> also, if Jigsaw's intentions was to let Lynn go, and in the end seemingly wanted to let them both go, why did he put the shotgun collar on her in the first place? Like, does he not feel bad at all about this? I mean, he's already dead, so who cares? <laughs> Another year, another saw. So here's a fun fact for you guys. So in Farmingham, Massachusetts at the AMC movie theater, a showing for the B movie was scheduled for a late night showing. That was until the movie that they played, instead of Jerry Seinfeld as a B, was the autopsy of John Kramer. Yeah, uh, they accidentally played Saw 4 and not the B movie. <laughs> Oddly enough, the same thing would happen at a showing of Megamind where the theater accidentally played Saw 3D instead. I mean, honestly, given how goofy Saw 3D is, I don't think it would be as traumatic as, say, well, that. Anyway, so it's revealed in the last movie that John coats a tape in wax and swallowed it, and it's addressed to this guy, Detective Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman was actually named after Greg Hoffman, one of the producers for the first Saw movie, who unfortunately passed away after the release of Saw 2. We're doing Saw 3 and we're a go, and unfortunately Greg died two days later, which was the biggest loss. He was the kindest, kindest caring guy you'd ever want to meet. After his death, Mark Hoffman was a character created for Saw 3 as another detective looking into the Jigsaw case, next to Detective Carey, Donnie Wahlberg, and our main character for Saw 4, Daniel Rigg. I find it admirable that the team wanted to dedicate a character to one of the people that made the first Saw movie possible, and I'm sure that they would be honored to be recognized in this movie with their own character. Too bad that character is ass. And this is nothing against Greg or even the actor because I think he plays a great villain character, but Hoffman just sucks as a character. Spoiler alert, but this random cop who had a single scene in Saw 3 is now the new Jigsaw killer, and it's revealed that he was also, also helping Jigsaw in the games. I said this when talking about Saw 2 that Jigsaw is very reliant on the authorities around him hunting him down being utterly stupid. Hoffman is even luckier in this sense because he's a literal cop also looking into the Jigsaw case. So not only can these morons not find a single connection at all, but they're also feeding information to the most obvious villain cop who doesn't come across as Jigsaw whatsoever. So the last three Saw movies tried to amplify the stakes in regards to these games. We went from 
from two guys in a room to an escape house scenario to whatever the fuck was going on in Saw 3. I guess a haunted house trial surgery thing. So how do they hype up the games this time? It's one dude going around town, discovering prepared traps in different locations around the city. And the lesson, I guess, is not to rescue people. Fucking what? Okay, so there's already a ton of issues with this already, but the biggest one being how the fuck did Jigsaw pull off a game in multiple locations and none of these investigating cops who are also going to said locations as well as Detective Briggs, how are they so stupid to not discover the next locations of the games before Briggs even gets there? If they're all doing the same game and they all have been investigating the same case, how do these cops only manage to come moments after? So I guess the only difference between Saw 3 and Saw 4 is that Jeff has to save people from the traps, whilst Briggs has to put people in them or not save them. This really does act like a sister movie to Saw 3, but it's even stupider somehow. So for whatever reason, Jigsaw wants to teach Briggs not to go through doors? Terry, do not go through that door! You know never to go through an unsecured door, ever. Hoffman, what the fuck is that? Oh, and also, Jigsaw kept Donnie Wahlberg alive the whole time? I don't know who the fuck was taking care of him. Cause he's been held captive since Jigsaw died, so it's not like John was with him. Or Amanda. You wanna tell me it was Hoffman the whole time? Cause like... No, I don't believe you. This movie and the second one also have the weirdest editing I've ever seen. At least Saw 2 made these weird edits to advance the plot. I don't know what the fuck is this. <laughs> Also, a lot of the traps in this movie don't make a whole lot of sense. There's this back brace thing that will sever this dude's spine, but like if he just leans his head forward a little bit, it's not gonna do anything. Also, this scale trap is confusing and weird. Like, why is this block of ice melting under him, but the two ice blocks above his head aren't melting? Also, would no one notice that the electricity isn't actually connected to the water? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter because Hoffman reveals himself as Jigsaw's apprentice and no one learns a goddamn thing. At least this movie shows at least one person who deserved to die in a Jigsaw trap. So that's cool, I, I guess. Oh yeah, and this movie is the movie that introduces two other people and this whole side plot with John's ex-wife, Jill Tuck. And look, no offense to the actress or anything, I'm sure she's a very nice lady, but it's very obvious that the only reason why she's in the franchise is not for her acting ability because she clearly doesn't have that. Oh, you're friendly with the producers mm -hmm. beforehand? Mm -hmm. How do you know them? Well, I was engaged to Mark Burke. Yeah. So. That, that would do it. <laughs> yeah. Look, the year was 2007. The recession was a year out. Some people need to pull a casting couch to get by. Okay, so here's the deal with this, I guess. This guy, FBI agent Peter Strom, is investigating the Jigsaw case and is interrogating John Kramer's wife. The plot twist of this movie is that it's actually taking place during the events of Saw 3? So after Detective Carey was found, Hoffman started the game with Briggs and Donnie Wahlberg, and I guess this guy's supposed to be John Kramer's divorce lawyer or some shit. And while that game is going on, Saw 3 is happening, and the only reason Jeff ends up dying is because Detective Strom is redirected to Gideon's meatpacking plant, a business that was started up by John. And the reason why he started doing all this in the first place was a series of tragedies that would seemingly take place all at once. So for one, John and Jill were expecting a baby son that they were gonna name Gideon. Do you know anything about the Chinese Zodiac? Oh, fuck you. Also, I don't know why you name your child after a meatpacking plant, but I mean, I guess Gideon is a normal enough name. And then John gets diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Then he tries to kill himself, but he lives, and that's why he became Jigsaw. The issue with introducing Jill is that she kind of takes credit for starting John's murder spree. Before the attempted suicide, before the cancer, John lost his own son to a druggy crushing Jill behind a door. So if Jill and this son are really the catalyst for most of John's mental decline and murder spree, not only does that disregard the most unique aspect of John as a villain, that being that he's dying himself, whilst killing people to teach them the value of what little time they have left. 
But also, Jill is essentially an accessory to Jigsaw. She knew about John's work. She knew the things that happened between her and John was the catalyst to that. She knew about Amanda. She personally knew Amanda. And she owns all of John's assets. And yet she never gets held accountable throughout the entire series. I mean, legally speaking, she probably hasn't done anything illegal. And no, she didn't kill anyone. I mean, she attempts to later, but she knows so much about this guy and his accomplices, and she even knows Hoffman is the new Jigsaw killer. Why the hell does no one arrest her for obstruction of justice or some shit? There is so much responsibility that is put on Jill that it kind of muddies everything that made John Kramer unique and puts so much importance on Jill when she doesn't really deserve this much credit. She's just someone who refuses to stop Hoffman for whatever reason. If she doesn't believe in John's philosophy and thinks he's a crazy murderer, what's making her stay silent? She doesn't owe a thing to Hoffman. Anyway, so Briggs fails all of his tests, he doesn't figure out that all he has to do is stop saving people, and then he attempts to save everyone because just when you thought he understood the game, he doesn't. Maybe he just really wanted to kill a rapist just once. Oh, and I forgot this funny scene where Jigsaw's first ever test done is on this guy who killed his unborn son. And the dude actually manages to survive his trial, but then immediately runs into barbed wires and dies. Like that wasn't even intended for him. He just ran into it. Fucking idiot. That's dumb. You should kill yourself. <laughs> The end. So you get done with Saw 4 and you think to yourself, man, that was kind of shit. But the next film has a new Jigsaw killer who is also an undercover cop. This movie more so exists to set up Saw 5. So Saw 5 should at least be fun, right? And then you watch Saw 5. They just keep pumping these things out, don't they? Even during the 2008 recession. So you watch Saw 5 and immediately figure out what the plot twist of the movie is gonna be. Yeah, th they all clearly could have won the game all without dying. This is where Hoffman completely takes over as the Jigsaw Killer, so his games are full of deception and lies. But wait, wait, hold on. Hello, wait, Mark. hang on. From birth, what? you've all been given the advantages of few others. Yet through poor moral decisions, you've used these advantages to selfishly further only yourselves at the expense of others. Hold on, that's that's John Kramer's voice. That that's that's Tobin Bell. So is this still John Kramer's games? So. Uh this is what's going on, okay? Hoffman decided to become a Jigsaw copycat to kill his sister's murderer. After killing that guy, Kramer drugs and recruits Hoffman, where it's revealed he's pretty much been working with Jigsaw even before Amanda showed up. I guess he was just behind the bathroom game too, you just had to redirect the camera slightly to the right. Yeah, sorry Amanda, I would help you set up this game, but I I'm currently on lunch break. Just keep an eye on Peapaw Jigsaw, won't you? Amanda. Y yes Jigsaw? I'd like to play a game. Look, Jigsaw, I'm sorry, I don't have Uno. You have Uno, you fucking bitch. But anyways, when Jigsaw died, Hoffman was rewarded as head of investigations. But oh no, it turns out Jigsaw is still somehow killing people. But by this point, the police are smart enough to know that, you know, John is dead, so this has to be one of his accomplices. So they start looking into whoever is connected to John. But they're still quite stupid because the Jigsaw killer is literally right there. Also, keep in mind too that all of the tapes made for this game are John's voice still. So he had to have made these games before his death. And all the victims he wants to punish after he dies are in these folders left behind by Jigsaw. So Jigsaw is somehow still creating all of these death games before he dies. And despite not accounting for all the things that could change and fuck over his plans, since he's not alive to predict any post-mortem changes, but he still manages to conduct successful games each and every time. <laughs> anyway, so Peter Strom is shown to be the guy that discovered Jigsaw dead and kills Jeff in the third movie. He's knocked out by Pig Mask and then is put in the first trap in the movie that isn't just a flashback. He's put in a trap that is a cube that is filling with water to drown him. But he performs a tracheotomy on himself with a pen and actually manages to survive a rigged trap. After his tracheotomy, Peter is removed from the jigsaw case for... 
what I can only assume is literally no fucking reason. He starts his own investigation where he is already assuming that Hoffman is the new Jigsaw killer. During the investigation, Hoffman is conducting the next Jigsaw game, where we go back to a bunch of people working together, except it's a free-for-all fight to the death kind of thing. Except it's not because it's so obvious that all the traps were made for five people and yet they all assume that they have to kill each other to survive. The tub wasn't meant for one person. We, we were supposed to hold one cable each and suffer a small shock. It was meant for five people. They all were every game. We only needed one key in the first room. They all worked and any one of them would have opened every collar. The second room... Three tubes are large enough for more than one person. Oh yeah, no fucking shit. None of you even wanted to try. The traps in this movie are pretty lazy in my opinion. It's just rehashed traps that we've seen before. Collars that pull back against each other. Nail bomb rooms. The bathtub makes a comeback in this and he is dirtier than ever. The only new sort of addition would be the 10 pints of blood. Somehow you expect me to believe that he lives with his arm looking like that? I'm not showing that on screen because it's nasty. <laughs> this movie more so exists to get rid of Peter Strom, whether that be by Hoffman pitting the Jigsaw murders on Strom or just outright killing him. Literally, this movie just exists to make sure that Peter has a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. <laughs> because Hoffman isn't caught in this movie. He actually doesn't do a whole lot, except for get a promotion, watch the traps, and then take out Strom because literally he's the only one that knows that he's Jigsaw. And he succeeds at all of these things with little to no effort. And once again, no one learns a goddamn thing. Also, Jigsaw has been killing for so long that even when these people are put in a Jigsaw trap, they know exactly who this guy is. What did you do to me? I didn't do anything. Jigsaw. I knew this was gonna happen to me. Despite there not being a ton of media coverage on the Jigsaw case that we have seen in the movies, I guess to these people, he's become like a local urban legend or something. Also, Strom is crushed in a room where the walls close in when he threw Hoffman in a glass box, which actually would have saved him if he had just listened to the tapes. But Hoffman wouldn't have risked his own life, let alone let Peter win, so why the hell would he make a tape telling him the truth? Did he just assume that Peter wouldn't have completed the tape? until after he threw him in the glass box. You know, whatever, it doesn't even matter. So everyone dies in this movie and Peter is being pinned as the new Jigsaw killer. So who, who cares? And he too is also dead, so it doesn't matter. The end. So Saw 5 is weird because I can't say it's a good movie. There's a lot of continuity things in between that make no goddamn sense. At least I kind of understand why Hoffman would want to carry out John's legacy. I mean, he's done this before. Unlike Amanda, where I, I literally don't understand what her motives are, other than she really wants to get down and dirty with Jigsaw. But to be completely honest, I don't really know if Hoffman was planning on committing any more murders. All he wanted to do was kill his sister's killer. I mean, maybe he did have more of a desire to continue afterwards, but we never see that ever. If John hadn't drugged and convinced Hoffman to work with him, he probably wouldn't have continued killing people and only wanted to kill this one dude. What's even funnier is that he literally acknowledges that he knows the victim as the murderer of his sister literally at the crime scene and nobody sees this as a red flag fucking at all again smooth brain. So that was Saw 5, and at this point with all the cliffhanger endings from Saw 4 and 5, the production team knew that these movies would make money, no matter how shit they are. They're just so cheap and easy to make, and the box office pays them back tenfold. So at this point, they're prepping for every Saw movie to have a cliffhanger ending, so that they can make more sequels and make more money. Honestly, at this point, I'm actually looking forward to Saw 6 after that ending whatever that was. I'm looking forward to taking a walk through right now and uh, being terrified. So you watch Saw 6 and... Honestly, it's not that terrible. Saw 6 has some of the more memorable traps from the series. I think by this point of the franchise, the creators 
knew what these films were. They spent so long trying to make this mystery cop drama thriller that the traps just kind of came as an afterthought. They weren't really upping the stakes in Saw 4 and 5. They were just copying off the of shit that they already did before. They wanted to focus so hard on getting Hoffman in the clear and to get rid of everyone who was out for him, even though I, I literally don't care for this character at all. But now that Hoffman accomplished everything in terms of getting the police to misdirect their attention onto Strom, now Saw 6 can go back to being a fun torture porn. But this time with social, social commentary. commentary. Now, I've read that in the Saw movies in general, they've always had this sort of social commentary to their movies. Whether that be a critique on the police or something about survival instincts or whatever it may be, there's always been like this underhanded message towards some sort of social issue. And I feel like the only reason people started having this perception was when Saw 6 came out. And then there's Spiral. We will talk about Spiral later. So this is a movie about criticizing the healthcare system, and you may think that that's an interesting choice given that the main villain of the franchise is a cancer patient. And you're right. I actually think that this movie has some great social commentary about the healthcare system barring people from life-saving care due to their treatments hurting the bottom line of these rich insurance companies, which results in a lot of people dying because they can't afford treatment. And so the great social commentary of the healthcare system starts with uh, two money lenders who pulled an Illuminati and trapped people in debt that they couldn't pay off and sued them and stole their homes and their cars. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but not really, actually. Anyway, <laughs> the Pound of Flesh trap is up there in being an iconic death trap in the Saw franchise alongside the reverse bear trap and the Venus fly trap. I mean, if we're gonna be honest, you probably have more of a chance of just pissing on your side of the scale and using bodily fluids or your clothes than uh, cutting your own arm off. But I guess when you're up against a dude that immediately guts himself to win, I guess you gotta do a little more than just pulling your dick out. Look at my goddamn arm! What the fuck am I supposed to learn from this, huh? Arm. You know, hypothetically, if the cops are investigating these games right after they happened, she could theoretically get her arm back, I think. Look, all I'm saying is that if they can reattach a cutoff penis after it got bobbited, anything is possible. So Jill Tuck returns in this movie. I mean, technically she was in Saw 5, but she didn't really do much other than like assess John's possessions. It shows us that in Saw 5, Jill received a box that she conveniently had the key for and now we finally get to see what's inside the box. And it's another reverse bear trap. And another dying wish envelope from John. So at this point, Jill is an accessory to murder in this movie. There, there's no doubt in that. And the fact that no one has held her accountable is insane. Not only does she provide yet another post-death game set up by John to Hoffman, so more people are gonna die because she gave him the files, but also she tries to kill Hoffman in this movie. Honestly, as much as I don't like Hoffman as a character, if he had died to this bitch, I was gonna be very upset. So the man up for the test is this guy from Silent Hill Revelations. And if you think that was a joke, I'm not even kidding. It's the same guy, he's in both of these movies. <laughs> so William runs an insurance company that has an implied policy that only 30% of his cases will actually receive insurance coverage. This policy is what denied John Kramer from life-saving care that led to his death. So now William and his entire company is up for grabs. Now as creative as these traps are for this movie, some of the reasons why these people are being tested are really, really dumb. Like for instance, this first game William is put into is basically a hold your breath test. And he's put up against a man who is a chronic smoker and they have to see who can hold their breath the longest. I mean, honestly, at this point, if this isn't the most successful anti-smoking campaign out there, I don't know what is. So these trials are very reminiscent of Saw 3, saving people from traps by choosing who lives and who dies. So in a sense, you choose who lives or dies. Wow, the social commentary is so meta, dude. It's almost like that's what his company does when he decides who gets coverage and who doesn't. This movie so smart. 
Also waiting at the end of the game are Roderick Hefley and his mom. And this Jill Tuck impersonator. Oh, I'm sorry, did I forget to mention that Jill Tuck is in this movie? I if you forgot, that's okay, because sometimes I forget she's even a character. <laughs> okay, now I know that Jigsaw is setting up these games post-mortem because he's literally just hanging out in these tapes now. <laughs> this means that he is the one who sets up every single game in this franchise, and Hoffman has just been carrying out his last wishes. Honestly, John's brain cancer must have gave him the ability to see into the fucking future, because holy shit. So William is going through these traps. He hangs a young dude over this elderly lady because I guess, I don't know, he didn't have a family or something. So much for that survival instinct stuff, huh? This lady takes an arrow to the face. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> so the shotgun carousel is one of the most over-the-top things that I've ever seen in a Saw movie and it's amazing. <laughs> and what's interesting is that only two out of the six people on the trap can actually live. So only 30% of the people on the ride can be chosen to escape, just like William's company policy. I see what you, I see what you did there, movie. That was really clever. <laughs> so it turns out that Roderick Hepley and his mom aren't actually William's family. Rather, it's this Jill Tuck impersonator who is his sister and these two are actually the wife and son of a dude that William denied coverage of, which resulted in him dying. So Roderick Hepley is given the chance to either let William uh, live or die, uh, and he chooses to kill him. I respect that decision. Fuck the healthcare system. So other than the twist being that William likes to talk to his sister over the phone like he's down to fucking Alabama. Hey, babe. Good. Listen, I am so, so sorry, but I can't make dinner. Love you. Hey, babe. Love you. There is one last twist of this movie that is equally as stupid. So it turns out Amanda Young was there the night that Gideon was killed prematurely. So Hoffman blackmailed her into killing Dr. Lin? I, fucking huh? Why? Did he just need to find a reason to get rid of Amanda? Because it's like, what if Jeff decided not to kill Amanda? Did he just want to get rid of Dr. Lin? And if so, why? What, what the hell did she do to him personally? You know what? At this point, it doesn't even matter because just like everything in these movies, uh, Jigsaw has to rely on the intelligence of the lobotomized. I mean, and, and I guess now they're finally unscrambling some audio and revealed Hoffman as Jigsaw, but it took them over six movies and 50 some deaths to get to the true killers. You know, at this point, your success rate is about as low as my SAT scores. And I do YouTube for a living now. So you can tell how bad I fucked up. Saw 7 and- ah! Oh my god, what the fuck happened? So before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to talk about the promotional posters for Saw 7 because they're really funny. <laughs> the first one is John Kramer's face kind of breaking down via a rush of blood to the head. Oh my god, I get it! And then there's this heart poster promoting that this movie is gonna be in heart-pounding 3D. Because this movie decided as a marketing ploy to make this movie a 3D experience. Because that's what everyone was doing in the 2010s. And the final one I found probably the silliest because it's literally just a John Kramer mech suit getting built. And this has nothing to do with the plot, but it's so funny. We start this movie by cutting to Dr. Gordon from the first movie, burning his stub on a pipe to cartelize his decapitated leg. I guess to explain how he survived somehow because he's in this movie for like a scene. Look, man, it's gonna be explained later. Just roll with it. Jill Tuck takes a light jog whilst trying to run away from Hoffman, who she failed to kill. So only now that Hoffman is actually coming to kill her does she decide to spill the beans. I, I hate this bitch so much. Listen, so many people have died at this point, right? Because she was just like, I don't want to snitch. And hate her. Meanwhile, Hoffman is conducting the next set of games. The next Jigsaw victim is this guy who is pulling a Tanya head by lying and writing a book about being in a Jigsaw trap, even though he never was. Which honestly, I actually really like this idea a lot. And it's the reason why I actually really like Saw 7 in a so bad it's good kind of way. It does have good ideas in here with the fake Jigsaw victim actually becoming a Jigsaw victim. And honestly, I don't even think Dr. Gordon becoming a Jigsaw accomplice is a bad idea. It would explain the medical side of the traps, like keys always being inside of people. I mean, they just get Dr. Gordon to do it. This movie has great concepts in it, and the traps are sort of cool in theory, but 
they're just so poorly executed. Everything in this movie is so poorly executed. I mean, it is, it is such shit. Saw 7 is the lowest rated Saw movie with a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. And although I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the ratings from Rotten Tomatoes, this movie is rated so low for some very big reasons that were kind of already prevalent in the other movies, but here it really can't be ignored anymore. Number one, this movie is utter nonsense. So the first official trap we get to see on screen outside of Hoffman escaping the reverse bear trap is the public execution trap. And there is a reason why a lot of Saw fans think that this trap is dumb as shit because it is really stupid. How the hell does Hoffman set this whole thing up without anyone noticing? I mean, it's in the middle of the street in a giant city in broad daylight. Also, the Jigsaw case is so well known at this point and so many investigators have been involved in this that you think when this Bobby guy started lying about being a Jigsaw victim that of all people to question him, it would be the police? I mean, they have all of his surviving victims documented. They get together for like Jigsaw therapy circles. I mean, you would think that they would want to get a witness statement from him if he's claiming to be a Jigsaw victim, but no, and no cop ever questions this. Also, both Amanda and Dr. Gordon are both victims of Jigsaw who later become accomplices. I'm almost kind of shocked that the police don't keep tabs on the victims. I mean, granted, there's not like a ton of folks that survive these traps anyway, and only like two of the 12 people that did survive also became accomplices later, so... The accomplice survivor ratio is even smaller than the survivor death ratio. Also, this woman survived a jigsaw trap where she is literally hanging on barbed wire over lawn mowers. Yeah, no, this bitch is lying too. There is no chance in hell that this happened. How did they even get there? So this new detective promises Jill Tuck protection from Hoffman so long as she gives him details on Hoffman to capture him. Only thing is, they already know it's Hoffman. I mean, yeah, he killed everyone who unscrambled the audio and set everything on fire, but who gives a shit? He's in hiding for a reason. He's been removed off of the case because he's the Jigsaw killer. Meanwhile, Tanya had gender swap is captured and mocked by Jigsaw. So it turns out Bobby has been lying about being in a Jigsaw trap. And he's been lying about this even when John was alive and signed one of his books. So that means he's been lying about being a Jigsaw victim before the public was more keenly aware of the Jigsaw killer. And the only reason I'm saying this is because we don't really see public reactions and awareness to the Jigsaw games until at least Saw 5. I'm sure that the Jigsaw story was a big story in universe, but we don't really get to see that throughout the series. We didn't at least get public or victim awareness until the fifth movie. So I said that these traps are cool in theory, and that's the thing, uh, it's just the theory. A Jigsaw theory. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, uh, these traps are kind of bullshit. It's another series of traps where Tanya Head has to save all of these people from the traps, and they are solely reliant on someone else to save them. But the traps are fucking bullshit. There's this one trap where the woman has to be quiet whilst getting a fishing hook pulled out of her throat and it's ripping open her insides. Yeah, that woman would die of internal bleeding. This trap is just someone going towards these spikes really slowly to her face. It's actually pretty anticlimactic. A lot of these traps are just so slow. But the worst part about this is that Tanya Head's own wife is stuck in a saw trap even though she was also lied to by her husband and knew nothing about her husband's lies. So why the hell did she die? This is the guy who should have died. Why did she die? Fuck you, Jigsaw. This movie is full of Jigsaw traps. Some over-the-top ones, some underwhelming traps and ones that exist in a dream. And finally, Dr. Gordon takes down Hoffman and is revealed to also, also, also be a Jigsaw accomplished. Oh, God, fuck, what the hell? Not only is there no reason for Dr. Gordon to be a Jigsaw accomplice, but also there's no way he survived cutting his own foot off. He lost so much blood at that point that even if he cartilized the wound, there's already so much blood loss that it wouldn't have even mattered. I guess this was just the movie's way of settling things out of court with Carrie Elwes after he tried to sue. Oh yeah, and uh, we finally get to see uh, how the reverse bear trap works in person with Joe Tuck. And this would be a very cool scene, if it weren't for number two, the gore sucks. Okay, so this next point that I'm about to make kind of goes in conjunction with my original point on gore. I don't like gore without a purpose, but if you're gonna use gore, 
you better make it at least look good. So, uh, the, the blood in this movie is pink. You know, I, I was gonna say that Bobby actually had some of the more easier traps to beat, but I think I'm only saying that in theory because this fucking wheel thing is so dumb. Like, the chain has so much slack, just move it off the gears, it would've been fine. Also with the hangman trap, Bobby's friend here doesn't even need to move through blindfolded. Literally, Bobby could just move through this whole thing on his own and have his friend just wait for him. And his wife shouldn't have even been here to begin with. By far one of the most creative and brutal saw traps in the franchise mainline movies has to be the car trap with Chester Bennington. Now, Instead of focusing on the sad tragedy of Chester and his unfortunate death, uh, I would rather just show you the behind the scenes photos of this trap because I think they're actually really funny. One of my band members, neighbor is Mark Berg who produces the films. And I got brought up as being a huge fan of the Saw films and he asked if I would want to be a, in the movie. And I, you know, of course I said yes, because that's like, the coolest thing ever. I mean, and Chester had a blast cameoing in this. That just shows you the kind of guy he is. He is the type of guy that would want to be in a Saw film. <laughs> I think it's it's a really cool trap. Number three, Jill Tuck is still a terrible character. <laughs> I cannot emphasize enough how much I hate this woman. <laughs> so many people are dead, and I'll say it, it's her fault. She never agreed with Jigsaw's tactics. She never stood by him when he got cancer and completely disassociated with John entirely. I mean, I understand she had a miscarriage, and that is horrific and tragic to go through. But that is not any excuse to be a bystander to your husband doing shitty things. That is never an excuse to act all vague and snippy when the police, who are effectively giving you an out right now, and are trying to protect you. It is not an excuse to try and act like a jigsaw accomplice all of a sudden and pretend that you're fulfilling John's request when you're not. You're just committing murder. I mean, technically Dr. Gordon wouldn't have gotten involved at all if Jill had stuck to her own morale and just turned Hoffman in. Like, if honestly, if she's super against what John is doing, then why is she helping out his accomplices after he's already dead? This stupid bitch. So overall, Saw 3D is dumb but I kind of enjoyed it, like, a lot. It's so funny to me that we're getting Saw movies still coming out in the current year, considering how bad this final chapter was, and how bad all the other movies were. So when Jigsaw was announced to come out seven years after the series had concluded, it felt so weird, because, like, Jigsaw hadn't had any movie presence or significance since 2010. But then you have to remember what kind of year 2017 was for movies. And it was the- Oh no, it's the fucking remakes. But you know what? A lot of popular movies that we reference nowadays are actually remakes of different movies that already exist. The Grunge from 2004 is a remake of a Japanese film. So is Dawn of the Dead, The Thing, The Ring. The Body Snatchers, Night of the Living Dead, those are all remakes, and even those movies got remade again. They were shit, but you know. And after the 2010s, we got some pretty decent remakes that actually made bank. The Evil Dead movie from 2013 was pretty good, and then Stephen King's It came out the same year as Jigsaw. So is Jigsaw a reboot or a remake? Kind of, but not really. Jigsaw definitely is riding the coattails of remakes that were coming out at the time, but it is a continuation of the original timeline. But I refuse to talk about it because it's fucking garbage. So why don't I instead have someone else do that for me and be a little bit more positive than I will be about Jigsaw? Take it away, deed. <laughs> Well, for one, the chains were a, a bit too loose. It was actually kind of easy to slip through. Also, I feel eight minutes are too generous, so I would slash that in half. And, uh, like, a blender? Really? Uh -huh. well, personally, I would use a, a toaster. It's more on point. More yeah. Okay. Uh, anyways, I, uh, actually have something I gotta get to. I don't really want to be late on that, so... Lunch break? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, cool.
What's up? You don't know me, so I'll give a brief introduction. I'm the world-renowned jigsaw enthusiast and saw trap quality insurance checker, but you can just call me Deed. Speaking of Jigsaw... 2010 was when we got Saw 3D, aka Saw 7, and it wasn't until seven years later in 2017, wow, that's a lot of sevens, that we got Jigsaw. Saw is the franchise that made me fall in love with horror, gore, and literally made me who I am today, all thanks to stumbling across it at such a young age and treating John Kramer as my father figure. No, I will not elaborate further. Man, this franchise really took off. I mean, a movie that was originally just a small budget college film project turned into something massive, to the point everyone labels it as the forefather of torture porn films. So, being seven years dormant, how did they handle bringing back this bloody lovely franchise? Well, if I have to be quite honest, it's not this continuation that we were expecting, such as myself, but you know what? Despite my skepticism, I still really liked it. I can understand people not getting good vibes from the trailer alone, thinking they'll pull a John Kramer is actually alive, you guys, twist, but come on. I know the Saw films are known for their massive twists, but come on guys, they won't be pulling something like that. Our boy Kramer has been dead since... one of the films. After all, we get plenty of Tobin Bell cameos through flashbacks anyhow. Also, it's semi-realistic. I mean, we got true crime lovers and fucked up justice systems alongside corrupted cops in this film. So I always had this realism to it when it came to particular industries and systems. Hell, even Saw 3T was topical. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that, huh? I think another thing that was a turnoff for people is the modern technology, which, yeah, I can understand why. After all, these Saw films are all about CRT TVs and tapes and that nostalgic VHS stylized films, but it does kind of make sense on why they decided to use modern technology. I mean, it's been seven years, guys. You know, if you think about it, having a Jigsaw video display it on like a little kid's tablet does sound terrifying. Now, of course, the number one thing when it comes to Saw films is, is it just as gory as the last? Personally, I have to say, yeah. In fact, it's just as gory as the last film, just less cheesy. I'm looking at you, Pain Train. And the CGI for it isn't too bad either when it comes to gore. If you don't have good CGI, it's not going to look great. There's a particular scene that gives me the goosebumps and scratches that disturbed itch in my head every time I watch it. And sure, maybe it's not super realistic, but I'm not here for realism. I'm here for the bloodshed. Honestly, that's one of my gripes when it comes to people criticizing the Saw franchise. Oh, it's not realistic. Oh, the plot twists are dumb and too confusing. Motherfucker, if you weren't here from the beginning and understood the format of the Saw films, you're not going to enjoy this film, or any of the others, quite frankly. This film is definitely for the Saw lovers, not for newbies. If you are committed to the Saw lore and characters, then you will definitely get enjoyment out of this. My partner is a Kingdom Hearts fan, and we kind of have this inside joke of Kingdom Hearts fans, Saw lovers, People calling the lore convoluted when it really ain't that complicated if you just paid attention, Sherlock. It's the small details, man. I love the twists they use, especially when it comes to taking advantage of and using cinema tactics. Like, for example, a common one is something or someone was there the entire time, it just was off screen. And sure, maybe it's lazy, but I find it a clever way to introduce somebody who was possibly there the entire time. Like how this entire time, there's been a pile of dead bodies next to me, and the stench is starting to get to me, however, but I, you don't need to do that. You, don't move the camera. As for the plot itself, it has been about a decade since the last games have taken place and been played. John Kramer has been deceased for a while, so it's definitely a whodunit type of plot, trying to decipher who was the one bringing back Jigsaw's legacy. It definitely reminds me of the plots when it comes to Saw 2 and 4, as our cast characters work with or are in the law enforcement territory. Now, I was requested not to spoil this film, so I can't go into the nitty gritty details in regards to the traps, but I'll do my best. One of the traps that we got to see the most in the trailer was the Bucket Room, which is the first trap in the film. Man, I miss the days where the traps had genuine names to them. <sighs> oh well. The bucket room is very much similar to the Keys of Life trap from Saw 5, albeit the way to escape is different, but I'm just not a fan of how similar they look design-wise. For this one, we got chained collars and... bucket heads. They a bunch of bucket heads. <laughs> Dude, didn't even get a chance. I don't know why, but when I rewatched this scene specifically, I got the Mario Coconut Mall theme stuck in my head, and it was really funny, so... You can go ahead and do that, editor.
My least favorite trap is actually one that I do think is creative, which is the chain hangers trap. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but I hate it because, oh my god, it could have ended much more quickly if it weren't for this one motherfucker. Time is of the essence. Do not fuck around. Though the trap seemed to have been... delayed. Can't elaborate further on that, but I do like how the first two are connected via the chains, so... The Grain Silo Trap. Oh boy. There's actually a much simpler way to escape this, but shh, I won't tell. And quite honestly, the cycle trap and shotgun keys are some of my personal favorite traps when it comes to this film. But the one thing that I really like about the cycle trap is that you get to know a very well-known rule when it comes to Jigsaw. Don't fuck with the traps. Seven years we were craving for more. Or at least I was. And quite frankly, I like it. I know some people aren't entirely happy with the new Jigsaw in this film, but I find them quite interesting actually. Again, no spoilers, but they aren't like the rogue apprentice we had in the previous films. I do believe they follow John Kramer's philosophy in their own way. Though I can understand folks not interpreting it that way. And again, I will repeat myself, this film is definitely for the Saw lovers. If you want to know more about the lore, if you want to know more backstory when it comes to John Kramer, then this is definitely the film for you. You thought the knife chair was the first trap of John Kramer's? Well, it is. But what about learning more about the first game that ever took place? Or how about the first apprentice that John Kramer ever got? Well, you get to learn about that and so much more in this film. The only really negative thing I have to say is the poster design. Jesus Christ, who designed this? My only concern now, after the train wreck that was Spiral, is with the new film, Saw X, fucking up the timeline and actually making things a lot more complicated than they need to be. We had one horror movie with the X in the title that went horribly wrong. We don't need another. If you wanted to see how dedicated I am to the depraved, disturbed, and downright gory, you should check out my channel. My content is all over the place, but one thing's for sure, my banner's motto is on point with what I do. I do not hold back nor censor myself, even in the non-horror or gory-related content, and thus I've been dubbed not safe for YouTube. So if you wanted to see uncensored content or behind the scenes stuff, check out my tiers over on Ko-fi and Patreon pending. All of my socials are also linked over on my channel via a link tree. I'm uh, currently going through a bit of a rebranding and my schedule is uh, quite frankly worse than Lazy's, but I try to at least upload once a month. And hey, if you stick around long enough, maybe in 2040, you'll see my Saw fan film come to fruition. Nobody's gonna care about this, but I tried recreating my look from when I went out to see Spiral in theaters, but I actually didn't take that many photos, so just went with whatever. But speaking of Spiral, fucking good luck, Lazy, on that. Uh, as for me, I should probably get back to my part-time job. Uh, lunch is over, so good luck. Thanks, Deed. Uh, but this is still my video and Jigsaw still sucks, so you're wrong. You're a stupid baby idiot and no one should totally go subscribe to your YouTube channel uh, and follow you on all your social medias and support you on, on Ko-Fi. Nope, no one should do that. Don't definitely don't do that at all. So you get to spiral, and honestly, at this point, I don't know what the fuck is going on anymore. You pull a gun on your old man? I could have killed you. I got the gun. I could have killed you. I have weird opinions on Spiral. Spiral is probably one of the most polarizing movies in the franchise. I honestly can't tell what people think of Spiral. I can't tell if people love or hate this movie. It's the most nonsense garbage movie. Like it's legitimately the worst Saw film, easily. Easily the worst Saw film. Love it. And there's some people that are like, Adam, it wasn't that bad. This is a movie I genuinely Really, really fucking love. I think that this is a really good Saw movie and one that could possibly revitalize the franchise. To be honest, this would be a better movie if it wasn't forced to be a Saw movie because the twist that the new Jigsaw killer is this generic guy is also lame. Like, the way it's presented is just so lazy. This is a case where I appreciate what this movie was trying to do, but that's not enough to keep it afloat. Interested in seeing more of this world for a sequel as long as they can get better writers and focus it up. This movie isn't quite the groundbreaking Saw movie it wants to be. It doesn't quite elevate the content at all. Also, while I'm on it, I'm just gonna say it again. Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson are in a fucking Saw movie. That's a thing I just said. Fuck, I love a spiral. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I was just thankful Saw was able to take such a bold leap in a new direction, and I'm curious to see how this movie ages over time. Because it's two years later now, and 
I still love it. And I have feelings about Spiral. And those feelings are, if you love Spiral, you're not wrong. But if you hate Spiral, you're also not wrong. But you both are also, also wrong because this movie is confusing as shit. Do I look like a fucking Jamaican nanny? So let's talk about how this movie came to be. So after Jigsaw, Chris Rock, yeah, that Chris Rock, uh, had an idea for a Saw movie, but instead of having it be a continuation of Saw's legacy, it'd be a copycat killer, which I feel like these movies should have considered that idea fucking years ago. It, it brings me no joy that the zebra from Madagascar figured that out sooner than the producers did. Chris Rock is a huge fan of the Saw movies, and when he was given the opportunity to pitch his own idea for a Saw film, he took no time at all writing himself into the script as his own character, even though Chris Rock more so just plays himself. <laughs> Spiral is such a weird movie because there are things that I genuinely like about this film. For one, I think the way that the traps are shot and presented in this film is actually really good. Maybe this is like an un popular opinion considering that I'm talking about the Saw franchise, but I always thought that this fast editing style is so disorienting and annoying that you can't really tell what's happening most of the time. And it just reminds me more so of like a heavy metal music video than it does a movie. So when I saw that the traps in this one are slowly being shown all the details and mechanisms and everything to it, I thought presentation wise, it was so much better and less distracting. I mean, granted, we still get those fast edits, but it's few and far in between. It more so acts as a homage to the original movie style, if anything else. And that's what this whole thing really is. It's more of a homage to the series rather than a spin-off. Spiral is such a brutal film. Some of these traps are some of the most brutal things that I have ever seen in my life. But even though the traps are more thematically intertwined with the message of the movie, they are also total fucking bullshit. The copycat killer is going more so for this execution style trap where although he says the victims can escape, they can't, they cannot. Which I mean, is fine when you're considering that this guy is not Jigsaw, he's not John Kramer. And although he tries to link what he's doing to John Kramer, it's based off of some shit that he just made up that John never said. John Kramer was right. Spiral, symbol of change, evolution, progress. He's bastardizing the legacy of John Kramer, but that's kind of the point, I think. Also, he sounds like this. Hello, Detective Fitch. I want to play a game. Oh god, the Jigsaw AI is taking over! Throughout the movies, there is this on-the-nose message about police corruption, and Jigsaw's new motives aren't to give these cops another chance to appreciate their lives and learn a lesson from the bad things that they've done, but it's more so to give a warning to other cops that Jigsaw will punish them for being dirty cops. And this is where I think there's this sort of misconception that the Saw franchise has always had this social commentary about cops and police work in general. And I think this misconception comes from Spiral having very blatant social commentary, more so on the nose and barely with any nuance in comparison to Saw 6. The Saw movies were never meant to be a meta commentary on the police. Spiral just gaslit you into thinking there was this social commentary that never existed. And I promise you that this is not supposed to be a social commentary on how bad the police are. The cops in the Saw movies are genuinely just so fucking stupid. <laughs> and I can't say that the police work is any better in this movie. Chris Rock wants to be portrayed as this hard ass cop who can't trust anyone in his department because unlike them, he's not a dirty cop except he totally is. Because he goes out of his way to work undercover in drug bust, even though he's in the homicide department, not narcotics. And he breaks a drug dealer's leg and takes selfies with it. How is Chris Rock a better cop again? I guess he's like, unhinged, but like so is every other cop in this movie. Sam Jackson beats the shit out of his employees and threatens to kill them on the job. If Sam Jackson was beating up his own employees and threatening to kill them, 
I probably would suck up to him too. You know, just so I can avoid getting a broken nose. This movie tries to be more of like a cop movie, more of an investigative thriller, and it doesn't do a horrible job in doing that, except for the decisions that everyone makes in this movie is fucking stupid. <laughs> Why not instead of investigating a killer who is specifically targeting cops in your precinct, why would you not hand this shit over to the FBI, like, immediately? And why are these random people just allowed to deliver random boxes and letters to Chris Rock without knowing who these people are or questioning them whatsoever. I mean, I guess it is normal to send mail to the police station, but when it's just this random guy walking into the police station like he knows the place, and yet we never figure out who this guy is, I don't know, I, I think maybe you should be asking more questions. <laughs> In fact, when the Jigsaw Killer is revealed, none of these delivery people are mentioned at all. Chris Rock doesn't question if this guy has anyone else working for him because like, I don't know, clearly I think it does. I think he does. I think another issue with this movie is that they kind of just introduce characters and then those characters disappear and then we never see them again. <laughs> like Chris Rock has a wife and a kid that he talks about throughout the movie, but like we see them once and then they're never talked about again. <laughs> They just completely disappear from the story. The biggest issue with this movie is not even with like the intentionally stupid cops for social commentary or the bullshit traps that make no sense or even the disappearing characters. It's the fact that of all the fucking people they could have chose to be in this film, they got Chris Rock and Sam Jackson in a Saw movie. <laughs> How did we get here? Chris Rock's character is Detective Zeke Banks and Sam Jackson is his father, Marcus Banks. Chris Rock created a self-insert character in a Saw movie where Sam Jackson gets to be his dad. I mean, at this point, this isn't even a Saw movie. This is Chris Rock's wet dream. <laughs> like, like so far, he had Terry Crews and Sam Jackson play one of his own fathers. <laughs> and I gotta say, what a way to hype up your dad, am I right? That's like me saying that I want to make like a biopic or a movie and I want fucking, I don't know, uh, name an actor, fucking Johnny Depp to play my dad or some shit. And when I say that Chris Rock plays himself, I'm not saying that as an insult. I'm not saying he can't act or even that that's a bad thing. Because honestly, I don't think that Chris Rock does a terrible job in this movie. I just think that Chris Rock says... Some of the weirdest lines in this movie that make me go, huh? Eventually they got together. Yeah. After she got AIDS. Hey. Chris Rock is really giving the fans of the series what they really want, let me tell you. <laughs> the traps actually happen so close together and so simultaneously that it doesn't really give the audience enough breathing room. Everything in this movie is running at you at a million miles an hour with no breaks. Anyway, so you know how I touched on the fact that the traps in this movie are just execution traps and they don't really make a ton of sense? Uh, well, although I think some of the traps in this movie are the most goriest things that I, I have ever seen, and they are cool and all, but they're either the easiest traps to escape or the most bullshit traps that will immediately kill you. Whereas theoretically Jigsaw was always fair with people and gave them a fighting chance for their lives, this copycat doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Did I already say that it was weird that we're getting Chris Rock and Sam Jackson in a Saw movie? Like a modern day Saw movie? Because that's, that's still weird to me. Hi, um, this is awkward. So, um, full disclosure, um, the title of this video is actually a lie. <laughs> I, I didn't actually see Saw X because nobody wants to go see it with me because all my friends hate gory horror movies. I don't blame them because watching Spiral made me nauseous. Not because it was gory though. It was because it was so fucking confusing. <laughs> but also, I don't know, I kind of liked it. I think my feelings for Spiral are the same feelings I have for Saw 3D. I know it's bad, but there are some good ideas in here that I can't completely call it a piece of shit. Because it's like, I don't know, people are trying with this one at least. I think the team was at least trying to do something with Spiral. I don't know what the fuck was going on in Saw 7. Don't ask me. <laughs> Why 
One of the things that makes Jigsaw different in comparison to most other horror movie antagonists, like Chucky or Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger, Jigsaw isn't evil for evil's sake. He has a complex philosophy, because the man thinks he's Aristotle or some shit. He believes that those who are put through his tests lack the will to live or do not appreciate their lives or the lives of others. And as we've discussed going over the other movies, this clearly is not something that holds up. But here's the crazy thing. I don't even think that this holds up in the first film, let alone any of them. Like, think about it. Most of the accomplices that follow up after John Kramer's death, such as Mark Hoffman or Amanda Young, are the ones that work on the traps and carry out John's plans. Not like his wife or Dr. Gordon who turn a blind eye, but the ones who work with John directly and continue his plans after he is dead. All of the traps after his death are still set up and planned by John Kramer. I mean, unless you want to argue that the tapes are made using some AI shit, and it's just Hoffman the whole time. But also, John left behind these folders for people who need to be tested after he dies. So like, I, I don't know. He makes the tapes with his voice. He makes follow-up tape instructions for his accomplices beyond the grave. He sets up all of these sketches and plans for his traps that he knows he's not gonna be alive for. Regardless on which accomplice is the new Jigsaw, all the traps are still designed and the tapes and files are created by John. And a lot of these traps are not designed for people to escape. Unless they aren't rigged by Amanda or some shit, the majority of these traps are not made to be escaped on their own. I mean, once you get to Saw 3 especially, the traps become more dependent on another person to help you escape so that they learn a lesson from your torture. Which is like, fucking, aha? Uh -huh. If the series was made off of testing people's survival instincts and getting them to appreciate their lives through fighting for them, then how is making these traps where you're solely dependent on another person, how is that person gonna understand some sort of life lesson that's gonna help them in any way? Hell, even in this conversation in Saw 4, when John is working on the rack with Mark, Mark mentions how John wants Timothy, the victim of the trap, to die. Let's be honest. You want him to suffer just as much as I do. So yeah, uh, testing people's will to live. Yeah, sure, John. Now, the series tries to convince you that John Kramer isn't a killer. He doesn't actually kill people. He is testing them, and dying is just a consequence of failing the test. And again, I call bullshit. Like, regardless of the intentions of these death traps, regardless of whether or not John gives you the tools to survive, that doesn't mean he is not a killer if you fail. I mean, a, a rig trap aside, these tests are designed to kill someone. John might have given you the tools to escape, but that doesn't mean he is not responsible for not only causing you physical harm by putting you in the trap, but also the traps are designed to literally kill you if you fail. Like, the consequences are the same regardless. It would be one thing if he left you alive, but given his intent for these traps are to kill you if you don't respond to his philosophy, and saying that he technically isn't a serial killer because of that is dumb as fuck. John Kramer's trap strategy has the intention of two expected outcomes. Either the person lives and appreciate their lives, or they die and learn nothing. The fact that death is an intentional possibility based on the victim's inability to fight for their own life means John Kramer is killing people that he believes doesn't have the will to live and doesn't deserve to live because of that. And he bases this off of what exactly? How does he determine who is worthy of being tested? Well, starting from the very first movie all the way to Saw 7, we have self-harm, calling in sick from work when you're not sick, being a drug addict. Actually, I don't even really know why this guy's even here. Jealous of other doctors or some shit. I don't, I don't actually know. Cheating on his wife, stalking people and taking pictures of them even though that's literally his job because he's a freelance photographer. Being a police informant. All of these guys had fake evidence planted on them and that's why they're all here. I'm not really sure why they need to suffer a saw trap even though they're already falsely convicted felons. And this kid is the son of the lead detective and isn't here to actually learn any lesson. He's just a pawn so that John can fuck with Donnie Wahlberg, who only gets tested later so that Mark Hoffman can get a boner for a man going through doors. In and out of the police system, literally trying to catch Jigsaw. 
being a witness to an accident and not helping, letting a guy go off easy for the murder of a child. And this guy actually did kill this guy's son, but he does seem really remorseful about it. And I guess she's been unfaithful and she's been distant since the death of her son. But that's not even why she's here. The only reason she's here is because Jigsaw needs brain surgery and she's the only one who can do it. Also, he's being tested because he can't get over the death of his son. Jigsaw, what the fuck? Literally only here to die. Defending criminals, all of which get tested in this movie. Prostitution, being an abusive husband, staying with said abusive husband in an abusive marriage. Blame the victim, why don't you, John? This guy is a rapist, killing John's unborn child. And the whole reason that this cop is going through all of this in the first place is because he's obsessed with the Jigsaw case. He is doing his fucking job. Jigsaw is anti-working class because he hates when people do their jobs. So this one doesn't even really count because it's just a jigsaw copycat, but he's murdered for killing Mark Hoffman's sister, so sure, I guess. And I guess everyone is getting tested in the Fatal Five game because they were all somehow involved with this arson incident that killed some people that we don't really see or talk about. But also, this guy shouldn't even be associated with all these people because he was reporting on it and exposing what happened. Like, he was doing a good thing. What the fuck, Jigsaw? Jigsaw hates British people. He was doing his job. Money laundering and bankrupting people knowingly. Smoking. I'm not even kidding. This guy is a nobody. This woman is a lawyer for the company or, or something. This is a sweet old lady. These are all men, except for like two women. Jigsaw loves gender equality. Fuck the healthcare system. They're all in a love triangle. They're all racist. <laughs> Jigsaw hates racism. She was in an abusive relationship. Oh, come on, Jigsaw. All these folks are here because this knucklehead lied about being in a Jigsaw trap, even though he wasn't. And this woman is literally just his wife and didn't deserve to die and it's her own husband's fault and I hate this trap, it fucking sucks! So yeah, uh, that's every person from the mainline movies who were put in a jigsaw trap. And although a lot of the people seem to deserve the fates they got, that's not really the point. Jigsaw's whole philosophy is built off of the time that Jigsaw tried to end his own life. He learned to appreciate his own mortality. You know, despite the cancer and the loss of his son, John survived his own attempt and realized that he was being ungrateful about his own life because the best part of his life was being with Jill. So maybe it makes sense when he's testing people that felt as low as he did in that moment, like testing Paul or Amanda. Like in Jigsaw's weird way of viewing how people don't value their own lives, maybe he sees a little bit of himself in all of his victims. These people are damaging their own bodies and lives or slowly killing themselves. You know, just how John wanted to die. Maybe he sees himself in all of them. And maybe the Fatal Five was just to teach them that the lives of others are equally as important as their own lives. Same with any character in the series who might have been the result of people's lives being ruined. But on a base level philosophy of not valuing your own life as an individual, do these people's faults make them eligible for that purpose? I don't think so. Like, there's kind of a cathartic feeling of watching people die who have done horrible things to others. Like, you know, obviously the rapists and the racists and the murderers getting tested is satisfying because as a viewer, you think that Jigsaw's punishment should only happen to horrible people. And it theoretically should, but that's not why John's doing this. He's doing this because he is giving people a chance to value their lives by fighting for them and making gruesome decisions to save their own skin and prove that they are worthy of living. By Jigsaw's own philosophy, everyone should have a chance to escape and value their own lives through this traumatic test. So these people that we look forward to see die are actually getting a second chance to value their own lives and escape with them again. And on top of the horrible people even getting a second chance at Jigsaw's weird torture redemption thing, therein lies the victim blaming that comes with Jigsaw's punishments. You know, people like Sydney and Morgan, who were in abusive relationships. They're somewhat grateful for Jigsaw for testing them, but they're not grateful because he taught them to value their own lives. They're grateful because their abusive partners are dead. Simone even points out how dumb it is to rely on another person to do something even more abusive and horrible to push Sydney into leaving an abusive relationship. 
Hell, Simone arguably did a very bad corrupt thing, but even she doesn't see how cutting her own arm off taught her anything. And what about Mark from the first movie? I mean, he called in sick from work when he wasn't sick? Yeah, so has everyone who has ever worked a job. You might as well be testing everyone at that point. And, and don't even get me started on the traps that involve another person either saving someone from a trap or choosing who dies because all of these people don't get a chance at redemption or appreciating their own lives because their lives are dependent on another person who is actually being tested. The tests aren't really in their hands and they aren't for them. They're for a different person. They don't get a say in whether or not they appreciate their lives because they're just a pawn. So no matter what way you try to justify it, Jigsaw's philosophy doesn't really work and it never really has since the first Saw movie. And I think the reason why this is, is because James and Lei were never expected to make sequels to Saw. If Saw was a standalone movie, then and yeah, there'd still be some flaws with John's philosophy. Like, Adam literally had no chance at redemption or fighting for his life. Jigsaw didn't really give him any clear instructions on how to survive, whereas Dr. Gordon was given an objective to prove himself. But even if there was no plan on Adam surviving, Jigsaw did give them both each an equal opportunity to escape regardless of that. And that was with the bone saws. The fact that there are two saws to cut through their own feet is showing enough that Jigsaw does believe in one thing. It's that people have to fight and make sacrifices to survive and prove that they deserve to live. The fact that Adam breaks his saw cutting through the chains and not through his feet, the fact that he's not willing to be honest with Dr. Gordon about himself, it shows that he is not willing to make the sacrifices necessary to survive. So even though there wasn't a planned way out tape-wise for Adam, there technically was with a sacrifice. And Jigsaw would have to save them both because that's what he does for Dr. Gordon, or else his game wouldn't have worked to teach them about sacrificing and fighting for their lives. But it's the fact that Adam wouldn't do the one thing to escape, and Gordon does, shows that this was always about proving you have survival instincts and are grateful to still be alive, because you made those sacrifices. That was always the point. So in that aspect, I guess anyone could theoretically be tested if John says that they need to be. But he chooses who does and who doesn't get tested based on whether these people need to prove that they have that survival instinct and value their lives. And in that sense, I don't see how smoking shows you don't value your life or calling off work when you're not actually sick or being in an abusive relationship or using drugs or grieving your dead son means you don't value your life enough. I think these people are just all people who are going through some shit, man. And this idea that they need to somehow be tested is more victim blaming than anything. And for whatever reason, the Jigsaw films validate Jigsaw's ideology, and they have his victims either become accomplices themselves or appreciate what Jigsaw did to them. It's like fucking it, no. John insists that his test worked with Amanda as an example but she just becomes another psycho that wants to fuck Jigsaw. The rest have to go to therapy specifically for Jigsaw victims. And this is a small percentage of those people who survived out of the 80 or so people who have died in this series. Like, if your success rate is at 2%, John, I don't think that's anything to brag about. And it's equally less impressive when only like five people believe in your philosophy. Jigsaw is a serial killer. But you know what? I wouldn't change a single thing about them. That's exactly how I like my horror icons. Absolutely psychotic and making no discernible amount of any sense. And with Saw X bringing back Tobin Bell after Spiral bombed for not having John Kramer in the movie, which by the way, I think is a stupid thing to get upset about. Like, Tobin Bell is 81. He is older than Joe Biden. He can't play the character forever. I mean, I, I guess that these movies just keep pumping out of Hollywood, then I guess maybe he could. Hopefully that time isn't anytime soon because if there's anyone more passionate about this shit than the directors who keep making these, it's the titular John Kramer, Tobin Bell, Jigsaw that keeps this mess going. And I can't even be mad because honestly, I want this shit to go on forever. I want this to be like the James Bond movies where one movie comes out like every two years. And I want this timeline to get stupider and stupider because if it's cracked out of its mind and stupid, then it must be Saw.
Do you hear that? You hear that shit? I have to slick my hair back just like that that gel lady on TikTok uh, in order to get my head into wigs because I have hair again. I look cracked out of my mind, dude. <laughs> I've been doing this since like 9 o'clock this morning. It is almost 1 a.m. I'm so tired. <laughs> you know what's crazy also about all of this is that I remember my dad used to watch this franchise as it was coming out. The first Saw movies came out when I was like four years old and I remember him watching like Saw 1 through 3 and being utterly terrified of those movies. And he and my mom would watch those late at night when we were all asleep because, you know, they couldn't actually watch it when we were awake uh, because we would have been traumatized <laughs> just like I was when I walked in on them watching Saw. <laughs> Honestly, in retrospect, he was probably forcing my mom to watch those movies because she hates horror movies, so. But now I'm about, you know, the same age that they were when they had me and my brother. I'm 22 now and they are still making Saw movies. They were making Saw movies up until I was like 10 years old and ended the franchise on Saw 3D. And then in 2017, they made Jigsaw. It's just weird that it's been almost 20 years since the first Saw movie and it's become this franchise that started in my infancy and now as an adult I'm still seeing these movies coming out and the story developing like 20 years later <laughs> and I think that it's an interesting part of horror history that has inspired so much of the horror genre now that dismissing it as torture porn seems disingenuous like it almost kind of feels like a cop-out instead of recognizing and analyzing how much of a pop culture I Icon Saw was. Instead, you can just call it torture porn and disregard the fact that so much of horror now and how we view horror movies is thanks to Saw. So thanks, Saw. Thanks for inspiring smaller, fresh faces to get into the industry on a shoestring budget and try their hand at making a movie. Thank you so much for giving me the idea to make this video. I, I love you. <laughs> the end. <laughs>